Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. Please be seated. As mentioned in weeks previous, I will be using our sermon time today to deliver my annual report as the context of today's sermon. Over the past several months, really beginning with my reflections on the Advent and Christmas seasons, I would say I've become gripped with the reality of the Incarnation. And this reality grips me for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, by God's grace through the Holy Spirit, he has mercifully, I think, granted me, as it were, fresh eyes to see the miracle of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, assuming our humanity in all of its beauty, humility, drama, and love. Second, I think it is God's answer to an unspoken prayer And this is what has formed my vision for Holy Communion in the year and God willing years to come. The question is this, how do we creatively reimagine ministry to meet the needs of a generation that is hostile to Christianity and yet utterly shaken to its core for abandoning the Lord God as its center, which the bishop retired so eloquently discussed in his annual report last week. That answer has taken the form of a vision for ministry, which I will now endeavor to describe. While our our work to share the gospel can and should take many different shapes, making use of all the tools and technologies at our disposal, it must always give first importance to personal relationships. Relationships with fellow believers for purposes of equipping the saints, and relationships with non-Christians to spread the love of Jesus Christ and so share the gospel. The mystery of our salvation is possible only because our Lord became truly human in order to redeem us. Therefore, our personal and congregational lives must consistently affirm the dignity and goodness of humanity. In other words, we at Holy Communion Anglican Church, as well as all biblically orthodox Christians, must embrace, promote, and defend what I will call from here on the incarnate life. That is, a life centered upon all which the incarnation of Jesus Christ makes possible. That by the grace bestowed in the sacrament of holy baptism and renewed through the Holy Eucharist, The incarnate Christ lives in us and works through us to bring salvation to a lost and dying world. Providentially, our lessons for this week, the last Sunday of the Epiphany season, and also our observance of the Transfiguration, offer a great springboard to explore this concept in greater detail. In this last Sunday of the Epiphany, the Church in her wisdom has always provided for us these readings of the Transfiguration of Jesus Christ. The Feast of the Transfiguration actually falls later on August 6th. So if it were not for this opportunity at the end of the Epiphany season, then we would encounter this narrative only once every few years on which the years this feast falls on a Sunday. Despite its scarcity in the lectionary cycle, which leads many to neglect this occasion in corporate worship, the transfiguration is of paramount importance to us in order to understand the true identity of our Savior Jesus Christ and our communion with him. This year, our gospel reading is from Matthew's account of the transfiguration, which our deacon read for us. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, the inner circle of the apostles, up onto a mountain. 
And though the mountain isn't named in the gospel text, we can take it as a symbol pointing back to Mount Sinai, where Moses received from the Lord the stone tablets of the law, as described in our Old Testament reading from Exodus 24. And it is also symbolically where the Lord revealed himself to the prophet Elijah. Matthew then cuts right to the chase, and Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Just like that, before Peter, James, and John stood Jesus in all his glory. There he was, manifesting the fullness of that glory, along with Moses, the great transmitter of God's law, and Elijah on the other side, the greatest of all the prophets. How are they supposed to take that all in? Mark's gospel tells us that the three were overcome with the fear of God. They were terrified, he writes. Comparing the three accounts from Mark, Matthew, and Luke, it is evident that even the authors themselves are strained by the limits of human language to truly and accurately describe the manifestation of Jesus' glory on the mountain that day. Peter, who but recently in the gospel narrative confessed to Jesus as the Christ and always the one first to speak with all of his bright ideas, is the only one who can muster any words to say. And if we read the passage without any historical context, then Peter kind of sounds like he's lost his mind, hasn't he? Like the air is kind of thin up on the top of the mountain. He might not be getting enough oxygen. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, and we'll just stay here. Peter's words sound so strange in large part because he's in a state of ecstasy. Being the good Jew that he is, Peter knows exactly what is going on here. Jesus is showing his true glory as the Messiah, the son of the living God, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. For Peter, this was better than scoring the winning touchdown at the Super Bowl. He is quite literally having a mountaintop experience. And therefore, understandably, he wants to stay there. Again, Peter, being a devout Jew, understood that Jesus' transfiguration was a sign that the times of the Messiah had come, the time foretold by the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, which in their day, the Jewish people erected tents in a feast of remembrance of their desert wandering and anticipated their redemption by a coming Messiah dwelling with the Lord in the age to come, hence the building of tents. It is likely the transfiguration took place during the Feast of Tabernacles, and so it's easy for Peter to recognize this as the fulfillment of that very feast. The Messiah is with us in the flesh. We must stay here with him. Why would we ever come back down from this mountain? Everyone who we would ever want to hang out with is up here. Do you recall this same sensation in your own life from time to time? Those Polaroids that we take in our mind when everything is going well and everything feels right in the world. And you just want to take a picture of that moment in your mind and hold it there and stay there forever. This is the sensation that Peter felt. And it is the same divine community which we enjoy today as the bride of Christ when we receive his presence in the sacraments. Are you aware of Christ's presence with us today? Recognize that when our hearts are in the right place, we can experience this same joy every single Sunday, if not every day. The difficult reality for Peter, James, and John was that the Messianic age is not one of hanging out with Jesus on top of the mountain. It is the, it, rather, it is the first and foremost, the age of the cross and that of the transfiguration, the experience of becoming light from and with the Lord, which requires us to be burned by the light of the passion and so transformed. That is, the transfiguration should be transforming us and sending us out to borrow from Joseph Ratzinger in his book, Jesus of Nazareth. 
The transfiguration also gives greater meaning to Christ's incarnation. In the beautiful prologue to John's gospel, we are told, and the word became flesh and dwelled among us, which quite literally is the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. When God took on flesh and descended to be among us, he, in the person of Jesus, pitched his tent and dwelled among us. Gregory of Nyssa, a saint of the early church and bishop of Cappadocia, which is now the modern-day country of Turkey, he, in the late 4th century, explains it this way. God, the Lord of all things, has revealed himself to us in order to complete the construction of the tabernacle of our ruined habitation, human nature. The account of the transfiguration thus reminds us of two things. First, it reminds us of the reality that the identity of our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed truly God and truly man, taking on our flesh and transforming it with his divine glory. This means that our imperfect human experience is transformed when we, by faith, are united to him in his death and resurrection. Our fellowship in the Holy Spirit now embodies God's divine love. Second, as with Peter, James, and John, we are not permitted to stay in our tents on the top of the mountain forever. Much as we may want to, Jesus is always with us, and we are called to come down from the mountain so that, like the disciples, we may continually learn how to listen to him, as God commanded. Through Christ, we are in community with God himself, and it is our job to go out and invite others into this community. If through the transfiguration we gain a greater understanding of Jesus Christ and his relationship to us, then how do we apply this new understanding to our daily lives and our modern context? The answer lies in the diagnosis of our cultural and societal chaos. To borrow from Pope John Paul II and the Second Vatican Council, when God is forgotten, the creature itself becomes unintelligible. Pope John Paul II cited this quote from Vatican II in 1986 when he issued his fifth papal encyclical and denounced Marxism and other forms of philosophical materialism, which, in his words, defy God as enemies of his own creature. This same rebellious spirit is still alive and well in the world today, as I know you are all aware, and in the West, and it has taken forms of neo-Marxist ideologies which have led us down the primrose path to a quasi-authoritarian atomistic individualism. Atomistic being totally particulate and separated from everything else floating around in space like atoms atomistic individualism. And in this experience, we worship our own personal experience as the ultimate authority in our life, while at the same time wielding the power of the state to quash anyone who might dare to suggest otherwise, that perhaps a higher power exists. If God challenges our ultimate authority, then naturally he must become the enemy. The obvious result of this collective shift in worldview is that biblically orthodox Christians in the West are faced with a totally unfamiliar landscape, one which requires greater sacrifice than we are used to. But there is another paradoxical effect of banishing God from the public square. Uh, that is, as our society progresses toward greater and greater forms of liberation, of freedom, we then suffer the effects of becoming increasingly and increasingly dehumanized. Though we celebrate these achievements of increased personal autonomy through technological advancements and social innovations, we are in fact losing the identity of what it means to be human. Take, for example, the alarming new trends on loneliness, which have gained attention in our post-COVID news cycle. This was actually released in just the last couple of weeks. A survey completed last year 
by multiple health agencies sounded the alarm on what is being called an epidemic of loneliness. A Cigna health poll from 2021 found that more than half of adults are considered lonely, and a shocking 79% of young adults, 79% of adults aged 18 to 24 are also considered lonely, which is twice the amount, twice the proportion of the elderly who we commonly think of as being at a greater risk of being alone, so to speak. God, out of love, made us for community with him, which necessitates that we also exist in community with one another, first as families, then as the body of the church universal. God's intention for us is reflected in the design of our bodies. Our brains are hardwired for interpersonal connection, and when we become lonely and isolated, our fight-or-flight response kicks in. It starts to set off alarm bells deep within us, the sorts of anxieties that you can't explain, but they're screaming out, telling us that something is wrong. This problem can be caused by the disordered use of technology, but even more so by the dissolution of those God-ordained institutions which he has put in place for our very flourishing. Marriage, the family, and the community of believers. If the biological alarms are not turned off, then the result is the cascade of health issues. Such is the present state of the Western world. Yet it is important for us to understand these wounds so that way we can infer how to best heal them with the salve of the gospel. If our present strife caused by the wholesale rejection of God is the problem, then our ministry as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Christ, is the solution. Indeed, if our societal confusion is the result of rejecting our humanity, then embracing the incarnate life in the community of the faithful helps us to reclaim what it truly means to be human. So what does it mean to be human? In simple terms, to be human means to be made in the image of God, the imago Dei. This means, as image bearers of God, when we understand God better, we understand ourselves better as well. John, in his first letter, tells us that God is love. He writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God does not know God, because God is love. If God is love then to be made in his image means that we are to reflect his divine love. And what does God's divine love look like? John answers this question in the next verse. And this, the love of God, was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In other words, the nature of God's love is revealed in the free gift of his Son given to us, so that we may be delivered from our sins and share eternal life with him. As the presbyter says in setting four of our 2021 common prayer book, Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. The love of God is thus our beginning, and it is also our end if we are reconciled by the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, which is itself the greatest act of love in human history. As Jesus himself says in chapter 15 of John's Gospel, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Therefore, the incarnate life is to live the full embodiment of God's divine love as expressed through his son Jesus Christ on the cross. Indeed, John goes on to say in his first letter, Beloved, 
If God so loved us, we must also love one another. Beloved, we are most human not when we are focused inward on ourselves and all our problems, trying to minimize our own suffering, but when we are focused outward, embodying the love of Christ. So now that we understand our identity in relation to the Lord, who loved us, took on our humanity, and died for us, what are we supposed to do with that knowledge? First and foremost, we must rely on God's grace given to us in the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And the incarnate Christ will thus work through us for the spread of the gospel. But what does that look like when we step outside of the church doors? It means that we must live and defend an ethic which is consistent with the love of God and the dignity of the human person. If a life lived in consonance with Jesus' self-sacrificial love for us is the truest form of humanity, then anything which distorts and degrades the dignity of human beings stands in direct opposition to God's goodwill for our lives. Sadly, because Western culture now recklessly celebrates everything contrary to natural law, which is God's loving design for creation, those of us who live and defend a Christian moral and sexual ethic can expect to find ourselves ever more the object of the world's scorn and enmity. The church must once more relearn to be comfortable with this difficult reality. The prevailing secular religion of radical sexual individualism runs totally contrary to the dignity of human life as rooted in the image of God. As a result, this cancerous ideology marches through every facet of public life. Real people will thus tragically suffer real consequences, be it addiction, abortion, physical mutilation of children and adults, loneliness, or depression, all in the name of self-fulfillment. When God is forgotten, the creature becomes unintelligible, and the result is real physical and emotional and spiritual harm. Beloved, the church is the only place where people can find true healing and refuge from the failings of a fallen world. Only the church, filled with people living the incarnate life, strengthened by the incarnate Christ, can offer a sure and steadfast defense of biblical morality and natural law against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, to borrow from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We cannot sit idly by, looking out the window, and sighing, lamenting that our country is going down the tubes. We have an obligation to stand as outposts of truth and faith and sanity amid a culture that has lost its collective grip on reality. It is precisely the church's job to advance the kingdom of God through the spread of the gospel. This requires the church to no longer abandon her simple duty to point out what is right and wrong, even when it is controversial to do so. Shamefully, her abandonment of that duty is what has gotten us here in the first place. Our call to embrace the incarnate life, then, is to accept our duty as the church, to be the hands and feet of Christ in our communities. We must be honest with ourselves, of course. Our work appears to be cut out for us, does it not? Add to that the acceleration of a world seemingly spinning off its axis, fueled by rapid technological, cultural, and political changes, and we may not know where to start. Here we must begin with a word of comfort. Though the world is ever changing, our job in sharing the gospel never changes. We must also not be surprised at the changes we see all around us. With the advent of the dual revolutions in progressive morality and artificial intelligence, for example, we are likely going to witness 
more social and technological change in the next few years than we can possibly imagine. And quite possibly for most of us, the most technological change we have witnessed in our lives. We are at a generational inflection point not seen since the dawn of the internet. Yet, if we put on the full armor of God, we can face these changes without fear. As I mentioned in last year's annual report, there is no going back to the old way of doing things. Now, more than ever, it is clear the church that we grew up in no longer exists. No, but change is a given. And if we wish to reach future generations with the gospel, we must be creative without abandoning our identity as the bride of Christ. This is exactly what we are doing with ministries like the Lively Faith podcast, inviting both the churched and the unchurched alike to consider the glory of scripture and church tradition. Podcasting is one of the fastest growing mediums of the last several years, and it boasts a broad demographic of listeners, but consisting primarily of 12 to 34-year-olds. By 2024, it is estimated that there will be over 100 million regular podcast listeners in the United States alone. It's incredible growth that we're seeing. This ministry has allowed us thus to reach people with the gospel whom we never could have reached before in previous generations. Praise God for that. At the same time, at the time of writing this report, which was last week, to be exact, (laughs) the Lively Faith podcast, since starting in November, has received roughly over 1,500 listens from over 500 people. And that's for three episodes over the course of three months. Over 500 people reached in less than three months' time, primarily by word of mouth, which, praise God, we thank him and also all of you for helping us in that effort. This success story, thanks be to God, is one example of how we can apply creative thinking to reach new groups of people with the gospel. And effectively, I might add. However successful though it may be, technology will not replace our primary responsibility to personally love and serve our neighbors by sharing the gospel with them. Consider the podcast once more. If we could reach an audience of 500 people primarily by sharing it through word of mouth, then what might we accomplish if we invited people to church with that same passion and energy? That's not to say that the comparison is perfect. It obviously is much easier to drop a note for someone to listen to a show on the internet than it is to convince that same person to come visit a church. And there is virtually no risk of rejection when asking someone to listen to a podcast. But therein lies the point, brothers and sisters. Our primary responsibility in sharing the gospel, and in sharing the gospel, is to cultivate relationships as people embodying the love of the incarnate Christ. And through that, through that responsibility, we bear the risk, the risk to our pride by engaging in those personal relationships. What is more, As the world loses touch with its true humanity at the hands of unchecked technological and social revolution, it is our willingness to risk true interpersonal relationships, inviting people into the personal embodied community of the church, incarnate community. And this is what will strengthen our gospel witness, our willingness to go out and make those relationships. So, having gazed upon the glory of Christ as we ventured down from the mountain and forth through the wilderness of 2023 and beyond, may we, Holy Communion Anglican Church and the whole communion of believers, with the Holy Eucharist as a source and summit of our lives, commit ourselves 
to prayer and renew our dedication to the spread of the gospel by doing the hard work of ministry, serving people, real people, making real relationships, inviting people into real community, and embody God's divine love to our friends and neighbors. May we embrace the incarnate life.